And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest jet show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the D20-based Fey Earth. He is not to be confused with John Byrne, but he is Neil Byrne. How are you doing today, man? How's it going? Sorry, I had I had to get one I had to get one bad joke out of my system, and I I looked at the name and I'm thinking, oh, okay, I can make it. I can make an old school comic book reference. I had no idea who you were talking about. I'm sorry. I didn't read comics growing up as a kid. <laughs> um, John John Byrne was the was. Was bet way back in the day the head editor at uh, Marvel, and he uh, was he was the person who um, who spear who spearheaded a lot of a lot of the golden age when it came to the X Men, especially the story Weapon X. All right, cool. Like I'm kind of familiar with a lot of the stuff, but like mostly because I had a bunch of friends in college, one in particular who was like a hardcore comic book mm -hmm. nerd. Like he was from an early, early, early age was reading comics and collecting comics and yeah, quite quite passionate about it. Like not one of these like gatekeepers. He's like he would always love when they'd like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna, you know, reboot everything and gonna have a whole bunch of new writers coming in and see what they can create. And so he like would fill me in on a lot of stuff. It was like so between that and the um the um nineties X Men cartoon series, that's where most of my comic book knowledge comes from. Yeah. I um I like to fool myself into thinking I'm a, I'm a bit of a historian, mm -hmm. so that so that play that plays a part a part in it for for me at least. Um. Now with that with that in mind, I I always try and open with the humble beginnings in a sense. So walk me through your first introduction to ro to um, role playing games and what was it that made it stick for you. So I first started into tabletop, it would have been in the very early 90s, I think I was about 10 years of age, and my best friend in primary school, his cousins, had gotten him playing 2nd edition Dungeons and & Dragons, and we started playing 2nd edition, and um, yeah, like, when I, like, so many, like so many people into tabletop, like when I was that age, I, was, I used to love reading about, um, like, the, love mythology, I'd read so many books in ancient Greek mythology, and also being Irish, like we have like such a rich mythology that we are like in school, in secondary sc or in primary school, like you know we're learning all about you know Cucullin and Pion Mucul and Oshina Tiernan and Og and mm -hmm. all of these stuff. Like we'd be learning about that in class, you know, mm -hmm. as kind of like as part of like not quite history, but kind of history. When you've got an eight year old and you're trying to teach them something that's roughly related to history, you know, you're talking about that stuff. So massive love of mythology. And folklore, even at an early age, so then we were talking about, you know, um, oh, let's play this game where you get to be like wizards and stuff, and you're elves and you're fighting goblins and all that. And I, I'm pretty sure I'd, I think I had read The Hobbit by that stage, hadn't gotten Lord of the Rings yet. So, so yeah, so that that was the start. Um, played second edition, and I played it for about five years or so, um, until I was about fifteen, and then um, and then I just stopped playing. Um, because I was 15 years of age and I know I just one day I kind of came to the realization that I had very little in common with a lot of my friends in school. Um, so like just to put this into context, um, in Ireland, in a lot of set primary and secondary schools, um, there would be single sex, especially in the urban areas. So I was in an all boys rugby school which would be quite normal for, for Dublin. Um, it's just historical stuff. Um, so I was in this rugby school. I had, like, friends, mates, and all the rest of that. Like, you know, I wasn't one of the, the classic bullied nerd in, in school or anything like that. You know, I had my friends, and we all hung out, and we played, and, uh, we played rugby, had all of our hobbies. But I was realizing that I, like, genuinely would struggle at lunchtime to chat to them about different things because all of my time was fixated on Dungeons & Dragons. I was like, God, I need to start like branching out. So I basically I stopped playing D and D to then kind of branch out into a wider range of hobbies. And it was very much a conscious decision on my part. I was like, mm -hmm. I, I should have more than 
one hobby that I hyper fixate on and spend every waking moment of my time thinking about. Because the other thing was that as well as that, um, like my best friend who I played and um, who I'd gotten into D&D with, we'd ended up, we were in the same primary school, we went to different secondary schools. Now we still were really like, he was best man at my wedding, he's like closest thing to a brother. We're still really close. We never separated. Um, but, um, and some of my friends in my own school, I'd gotten into d and was like, no, I really need to get some. So I stopped playing then at about 15. And then I did not pick up a dice again for like 20 years. So, yeah, I was like in my mid 30s. And um, just one day I look, re- realized, God, like, I don't have actually that many close friends around anymore. And it was just because, you know, life had gotten in mm-hmm. the way. People had moved, jobs, you know, people had emigrated. Oh, and I was like, I really like need to do something about this. I like I had a small group of friends, but not really. So I was like, and um, I was um, I was watching actually. I was randomly watching something on them um, online. Um, it was Geek and Sundry's YouTube channel because I love their stuff. It's like it's re- it was really fun. Like this is like early YouTube, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I saw Will Wheaton had the, his this game, um, Titan's Grave, which was a, um, a, a kind of a cyberpunk type sci fi campaign setting using the Fantasy Age system that was produced by Green Ronin. Mm-hmm. And I thought, this is so cool. This is brilliant. So then I, I bought that. Um, I bought the, the Fantasy Age core rule book and the Titan's Grave book, and I started a game. And it was each case of, I'm going to start a, a game of, of a tabletop again with some friends so we'll be able to be regularly having a, an ex, a reason to schedule hanging out because you know like you get to that age in your 30s and you have work and relationships and all the rest of that stuff that you forget to make the time to socialize with people you mm-hmm. know and that was kind of what had happened with me so i did that and then I, I then when the titans grave series finished i started watching critical role and they were starting about the same time so i was in I think I started watching Critical Role about two, three months after it initially started. So I became a big Critical Role fan. And then we played the Titans Grave campaign for a year, year and a half. Um, although I eventually ported it over to 5e because this might be controversial. Um, while I initially really loved the Fantasy Age system, the more I played it, the more I grew to dislike the system. There was some really great core mechanics in it that I loved. But overall... I really didn't like it anymore. So we, 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 we kind of ported everything over to 5e to mm-hmm. finish the campaign. And then it was around the same time as that that I then got the idea for Fey Earth into my head. And then I've been working on that for the last four years, most almost exclusively. Mm-hmm. Like I ran a Curse of Strad campaign there for a bit a year or so, a year and a half. I, I love the classic Ravenloft because, you know, I started in second edition. So, you know, Ravenloft was second edition as well so i was like oh i have to go back to that but it's been mostly then but um my own my own tabletop game that i've been working on since then so yeah that's me a weird kind of a very very old school start with a massive break and then like any normal person decided to best way to get back into a hobby was to design my entire own system and setting from scratch Mm -hmm. yeah now when it comes when it comes to when it comes to um fate earth Mm-hmm. As I as I understand as I understand it, even though Fey Earth is D twenty based, you have you have not tried you have not tried to build it as a campaign setting for, um, for any edition for any edition of D anD. d No, I mean when I initially so, the thing about Fey Earth, and this is what I say to people when they ask me, it's like where did you come up with this idea? It's like literally one day I don't even remember. I could have been cooking dinner. I could have been washing the dishes. I could have been walking it off. I genuinely don't remember, but. Out of the ether, struck by the news, as if you will, I had this idea popped into my head. What if every single creature from folklore and fairy tale was real and had always been real and always lived alongside humans? How would that have changed things? And what would that world look like? And that was where the idea for Fey Earth came, was that single what-if question. And then the more I thought, and as I said, like, I massive love of folklore and mythology growing up as i got older i got into neo-paganism wicca all that kind of stuff and like i'd still be a tree hugging hippie now i call myself a terrible lapsed pagan i went from a lapsed catholic to a lapsed pagan 
Um, but still, I've lots. Of, I've read lots and lots of folklore, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and coming from like even like other other European friends of mine, like I got a dear friend of mine who's Swiss, and she's been living in Ireland for oh god, like ten, fifteen years, and she says herself like, the Irish, the Scots, the Welsh, and then the Scandinavians, we all have incredibly rich folklore. But then you literally you have to go to the Balkans, you have to go to the Slavics before you start getting that again. It's weird. It's like the entire rest of Western Europe, they they kind of whatever happened they didn't keep it and retain it in the same way so growing up in ireland i was surrounded by folklore all the time so you know focusing on this and i was like okay i have this idea this could be a really great game but if you're going to do it i want to do it right and i want the creatures in my world to be as faithful and accurately portrayed as i can based on how they originally were described in folklore Mm -hmm. and the more i thought about that and what fake creatures were able to do in the stories and where is it this is not going to work in a 5e system at all um the magic um spell slot system is way too limiting for like like when you read the stories the most diminutive fairy could strike you blind they could wither a limb you know um like they were so crazy powerful like we think of fairies and we think of tinkerbell you know Mm -hmm um no like in fact like even the whole gossamer like the fairies in my game do not have gossamer wings because that was a really really late addition that the victorians put in to children's stories about Mm -hmm. fairies when you read any actual stories about fairies they don't have wings they never had wings they were literally just really really short humans in really fancy expensive clothing with terrifying magic powers so i did originally think okay how could i make this work in 5e and the more i thought it was like it just it won't work It, it just won't fit um you know, there's just just too many things going on, and like and, and like five E, it's it's fine and all. Like, uh, it wouldn't be. It's it's a system that I played a bit, and, and like it's it's good at what it does. But what I feel five E does is it's tried to make a really streamlined system, and I think it does that really well. Um, not saying that um, fair, it's uh, clunky or anything, but it was just like it it wasn't it wasn't working for me. So I was like, okay. So I then started working on, I was like, well, what kind of a system, if I was going to make a system on my own, what would, system would I make it? And the reason why I went with a D20 system was, was well, two reasons. I was most familiar with D20 systems. Mm-hmm. There was also a certain cynical marketing side of it in, well, Dungeons & Dragons is the single largest product in the TTRPG space. The overwhelming majority of people who play tabletop play D&D. So if you want to get somebody to consider buying your product, playing your game, getting into your system, they're probably going to be somebody who's played D&D. So if I have a D20 system, they're going to pick up the rules much, much easier than if it's some other system that they're not used to the mechanics of. And then the other honest-to-God reason was I love dice, and with D20 you get lots and lots of different pretty shaped dice. So that was like that was it, and that was them. So to, based off those things, it was like, okay, well, let's start looking at Let's start looking at a system. What stuff do I like about, about D20 systems? And also, like, when I'm not doing this, like, my day job is I'm a secondary school maths and science teacher. Mm. You know, this mm-hmm. is what... So I'm teaching people hard sums for a living, you know? So the math side of things was something that I was very, very quickly getting into. Like, what do I want mathematically and mechanically in a system? What am I looking for? Where do I want to give people choice and control? Where are you bringing in the random sec- section of things? You know, how do you want things to work in terms of modifiers and all the rest of that? So then it was just like building it up, like, you know, from that kind of idea of, and then still trying to create a system whereby when you then throw in the fey creatures and all the crazy powers to have a system that you can then smoothly bring these abilities into your mechanics and aren't having to have like separate rules for a fairy or a pixie you know or separate rules for a a brownie or a kobold and that it's all one one streamlined system and that there's not any other things you need to have for these monsters or creatures that you're facing as well Mm -hmm. so that that was that was it now given given the fact that this is a d20 based a d20 based system but not necessarily Mm -hmm. that d20 system which um, is a bit more is is a bit more common than some, than some people would think, and it's also why I, I tell people that just telling me the kind of die you use tells tells me j- tells me just enough to annoy me. 
Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Like, I, I've seen people, like, talk about, like, as soon as they hear D20, like, I don't want to play it. Because they know themselves mathematically what is your average like, you know, what's mm -hmm. your bell curve like with a D20 system versus a dice pool system. Yeah. So knowing your dice system and, you know, especially me and my maths brain or anybody, you know, like, you don't even a math teacher, but if you played in a lot of different systems, just knowing what kind of dice you're rolling mm -hmm. will immediately tell you so much about it, which is, as I said, it was a, another reason why I said, if I say D20, people will get that. But anyway, you were saying. Um, well, the thing, the thing is, in my, in my experience, um, even, that D, even that D20 isn't going to be used the exact same way. Um, Fading Suns, for instance, technically uses a D20 as its, as its primary die, but, um, but, it, but its victory point system isn't exactly the same. I've nicknamed that D20 Blackjack. Um, <laughs> since you're trying to get just you're trying to get as close to the line without going over it. Mm. Um, now when it now given that, um, what are what would you say are some of the things that are that are going to be are going to be familiar, and what are some of the things that are going to be less familiar to somebody who has cut their teeth on D twenty? Not just not just five E, but just the trappings of the d20 system over over the years period i suppose the simple the, the thing that's most familiar is you know you've got your target number that you're trying to match or beat you know mm -hmm. so it's like if you match it or beat it then that's it um there's no there's no um there's no degrees of success in my system um like well i mean as as the gm as the narrator you could bring like if somebody rolls really well you might say okay well actually you did pray so i'm gonna have something extra cool happen but in rules as written there's no further degrees of success so i suppose in that way it's the same as others um i don't i mean as i said i, I don't know if i could necessarily say there's loads of ways in which it's different i suppose the, the one thing about my system is that um everything you do in fair earth is an ability test mm -hmm. that's it everything is an ability check okay so you're literally you roll your d20 you add your ability score and then any other relevant modifiers you have for skills and training and the likes that you have in it so in that way, I've tried to make it very simple and very streamlined. Um, it's not. It, there's no questions of, um, I suppose, going back to things like, say, f um, 5e and other systems like that, where you'd be like, well, maybe, is it an attack roll? Is this a skill check? It's like, no, no, everything is an ability check. If you're trying to hit somebody with your saber, that's a fighting ability check. If you're trying to shoot somebody with your gun, that's a dexterity ability check. If you're trying to do some really cool, crazy thing with a spell, that's a magic ability check. So it's always really straightforward like that um and i have seen in a few a few d20 systems where things do start getting chunky and clunky and then you're bringing in you've got all these different modifiers stacking up of like you know that you can add to increase your role and then that can be added against you to increase the target number and all the rest like it's 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 very it's it's very simple in that sense, you know. It's like no ability score plus relevant skills, and then you you might have a like contextual modifiers from your GM of oh well, they're kind of hiding duck behind a wall, so I'll make it a little bit harder. But like that that's basically it. Yeah. Now, truth truth be told, when I look when I look at how you, when I look at how you have things set things set up. Um, Oddly, oddly enough, the ge the game that I find myself being remi being reminded of is True Twenty, um, which is which was the, which was the D twenty D twenty based project, the uh, die project that Green Ronin did before they did um, the Age system. Okay, right. Um, one of the one of the big things that True that True Twenty did was instead of doing the whole ability score and then use that to create your modifier, they just mm -hmm. cut the middleman and just said, "Okay, he, okay, here's your modifiers. You have you have three you have three classes, and ev and everything is t and a lot of things are talent centric." Um, yeah, it was basically a hack of um, Third Edition. Um, yeah, I never played third edition. Like as I said, I went from straight from second to then playing a bit of fifth yeah. edition. So I hear people talk about third edition and three point five and Pathfinder and fourth edition, and I actually have a load of fourth edition books a friend of mine gave me, mm -hmm. and I have wondered about running a game just because everybody says it was so different and divisive that I'm kind of curious. But yeah, I was like never played them one. So yeah, I was like people talk about them and I'm like, well, is there Thaco 
you know, it's like no. Um, <laughs> although when it comes when it comes to Thacko, I've always I've always had the mindset of Thacko is a is a decent idea that was explained poorly. Well, this is the thing. I people give out about Thacko all the time, and this is me as a maths teacher coming in. Thacko is not that hard. It's subtraction. Like I'm sorry, you take one number from a number in a table, and then you try and beat that. It's like it's not complex maths. It's basically like. It's a clunky system, and I I kind of get where the what they were trying to do, but it's like when people say, "Oh, so it's like it's people who don't understand Thaco, in my opinion, are people who had it badly explained to them because all you were basically doing was taking away one number from another number to get your target, and that was it. And it's like, but no, I never played True Twenty, so um, but that's similar as well as you're saying it's got um. Instead of here's your score and here's your modifier, it's just like no, your your score is your modifier. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's yeah. that's one of, that's one of the key things. Um, mm-hmm. that and um stream that in streamlining, um the class system to be to be essentially warrior, rogue, and rogue and mage. They called it adept, but basically, your fight monkey, your sk- your spell monkey, and your skill monkey. Um, okay. Yeah. Now. Now, obviously, what obviously because of the fact that everything is is based on abilities, I'm I'm guessing that's the reason why you have more ability sco- scores than um than say AD and D does, because the D twenty system has six and you yeah. have eight. eight. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I suppose I was, that was it. It was like I wanted to have a system like that was one of the things I really liked about Fantasy Age, you know, Green Ronin as well. That they're you're they have nine abilities actually. As far as I remember, yeah, it was nine in, in mm-hmm. Fantasy Age. I, I think it's nine in all the Age systems. I've recently yeah. started. Yeah, I think I was been recently reading the Expanse RPG just because we I picked it up and I was like, my wife loves the series. She's like obs- obsessed with it, and I was like, keep telling me you need to watch it. And I was like, oh, I'll get around to it. I was like, and the same thing. So it was nine. I was like, and as I said, I like this idea. Let's just keep it simple. So I had a long hard think about well, what abilities do I think or would be reflective mechanically yeah so yeah so coming up with the eight of them i was like well we need some sort of a physical ability um um you know how fast you are how intelligent you know and all the rest of them i was like and 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 i don't and and i always this is i think a lot of systems do have it but i always feel things like a perception or awareness should be its own skill i hate Mm -hmm. the way in some systems they tie it as a secondary ability to another skill i was like no that's like no, it doesn't, and and then I do feel that by doing it that way, as I say, it does it does help us. It just makes it a bit easier. You're not looking up a number to then look at another number, and then it's like no, no, just this, this, and this, and then put them together. Um, which, now, per person, person, the other thing that I could, the other thing that um that I had noticed is be, is being a bit a bit more freeform when it comes to when it comes to skit when it comes to skills. Which I'm, which I, I certainly approve of because, and since you gave a controversial take, I may as well give one of my own. Um, D and D has no bi- has no business using a, has no business with any sort of skill system because it was never designed for one. Now, I remember in second edition the non weapon proficiencies table. You know. <laughs> yeah, that was. That, that, yeah, remember like. That, that was thing. like two and a half pages or something, and you're like, "Wait, I can pick three? <laughs> yeah, the proficiency system in um in AD and D second was a neat idea, I guess, but it needed more time to cook. And yeah, yeah. I think um Adventure Conqueror King system has done a better version of that. Well, actually, what I really love is I love the way they do it in um. And World of Darkness in Vampire and Masquerade, the way they have theirs, you know. Well, I mean, in all the World of Darkness systems, whereby you don't have levels, you basically have points of experience that you can then just put into different skills and yep. attributes and traits. And I, I absolutely love that so much. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of that was part. Of, that was a big part, I think, of my inspiration of yeah. how in, in in my system, you know, every time you go up an even numbered level, you just get a free level of training and a skill talent or feat of your choice. Mm-hmm. So you can be like further custom. The whole, I think, for, for me. The reason, the, the purpose of the skill mechanic in my system is largely to help you further customize your character. Yeah. You know, that's really what it's about. Is like, I have these skills for you so that you can pick stuff that gives flavor to your character and makes them different. You know, um, like in, in, in my current game, um, 
that we've been playing now for god over three years when i first after i'd been after i'd got a couple of months into writing the fey art system and i have the bare bones of it put together um i then got a bunch of friends and i was like i would like to start a game this will be play testing i will be changing rules mid game this will happen would you be interested in it? Yeah, and we run that for about three and a half years, I think. There was a bit of a break when we had our little, or we had our little girl for a couple of months because babies. Um, but um, yeah, and um, and one of my friends, it was in the original group, had to drop out because her job changed, and she was playing a sorcerer. And then another friend of mine has came into the game, and is playing a sorcerer and completely different characters. And I had one friend of mine who early on had to quit because of work and she was playing a rogue and then another friend joined and they were playing a rogue and then they left and she came back and same thing again, completely different characters, even though they're the same class, like there's no subclasses in my system, but it's just a case of based on the skills that they've picked. Um, and even within the sorcerers, like they have special skills, we call them arcane enhancements that they can choose as well to further give you extra flavor. It was like completely different characters and that's the big part of like how i wanted the, the skill system to work is the purpose of the skills is so you can customize it's not just here's a thing that you can do in a random situation for a role you know it's like because honestly you, you don't necessarily need a rigid skill system to see if oh will i remember this fact or are we going to find our way through this forest without getting hopelessly lost or you know it's like you don't mm, necessarily need a skill system with that kind of stuff so i was like the skills have to be more than just a thing that you can then add on occasion to a random situational um you know role mm -hmm. yeah um it's interesting that you br that you brought up um world of dark world of darkness um give given given the fact that as I as I given the fact that you're using a class based system and obviously yeah. well World of World of Darkness is one of the is technically a classless system, but in but in practice a little bit less so. Yeah. Um and we, and um what I'm what I'm curious about is were was there ever a, was there ever thought about going full classless or were you always going to make it make it a class based system? No, I always wanted to have it as a class-based system because I felt well. Well, I suppose first of all, it's what I'm most familiar with. Okay, um, as I say, starting off with AD and D, and then other games that I've played. Um, um, with the exception of a couple of con games here and there, any time I've ever played tabletop has mm -hmm. been class-based. So it's what I'm most familiar with. It's what I'm most comfortable with. And you know, if you're going to create an entire system from scratch. I was already making life difficult enough for myself by trying to create something that was. Is it or an academic work based on the amount of research that I've been doing? Um, but um, but also I was like, as I said, I, I loved it. I, what I wanted was a system that was streamlined but allowed a high degree of customization. Um, and you either need to have something really well designed, skill based thing like World of Darkness, mm -hmm. where you've got a fixed number of abilities or skills or attributes that you can choose from. Um, or end you end up with, or or you gotta have like massive, massive pods of tables, which can just be, get really overwhelming. So that was a big part of why I decided, no, I'm gonna go with classes, but I'm gonna make sure that each class does have its own distinct flavor to it. You know, um, like that it's not that you know you 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 if you want to play this, you can do some really, really, really cool stuff. You know, every every single one of the classes. Or the or professions, as I call them, in my system, has customized has 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 customization both in terms of the skills that you can learn, and then further additional customization that's unique to that class uh, or profession. So at every uh, even numbered level, a player gets a, a level of training in a skill, talent, or feat of their choice. But then, say the fighter um, profession gets free levels of training and fighting skills, they get free combat feats that they earn, they get to choose favorite weapons. The gunslinger has gunslinger skills unique to their profession, like, you know, trick shot and sharpshooter and all mm -hmm. these kinds of stuff. The you know, the um the the rogue unique skills. The mystics they get to take sacred vows that gives them extra spells and stuff. Um the 
you know, the Sorcerer have their arcane enhancements and their favorite spheres of magic. The Witches have their major and minor amulets. It was like, they all have, I wanted to make sure that if you pick this, it's like, you're, you're picking it because you want to go down, you basically want to go down this flowchart of cool customization abilities. Um, and I and I did worry that if it was a completely classless system, it would become kind of overwhelming um, for a player. But also, like, I do want to have certain levels of, I suppose, restrictions would be the word that to use in terms of how people work in the world. So in the setting of Fey Earth, it's a very magical world, mm -hmm. but magic is also rare um, in that in Europe, not that many humans are born with the ability to learn magic. It's quite rare, you know, and even in the lore of the world, it talks about how, well, in ages past, from what the stories say, there was a lot more people born with magic. But over the last couple of hundred years, that's gone down. And we don't know if it's because of this new age of industry and science is interfering with magic or if it's something else, you know. And then you've like, at the same time, you've got, well, we've got fighters, you've got warriors. They're really good at what they can do with their sabers or with their, you know, with their canes or whatever. And, you know, likewise, you've got your gunslingers who are really skilled with their firearms. And, you know, it's like, I didn't want it to be just a case of, well, what makes this person with a gun different to this person with a gun just being, well, they got a couple of extra levels of skill. You know, it was like, let's bring something extra into it special. It's like, yeah, a fighter can be proficient with a revolver, but they're not going to be able to do the cool stuff that the gunslinger can do because of the skills unique to their profession. You know, mm -hmm. so that was kind of why I wanted to have a class based system and it was to give me these extra layers of choice for the player on how they want to customize their character yeah that i can i can certainly get that and get, since you since you brought since you brought up um cl since you brought up classes i'd like i'd like to go i'd like to go into a bit into those for a bit mm -hmm. um just just in terms of what just in terms of what each class is go is going to bring and what sort of vibe each class is going to give off. Um, I'll start with the obvious one in the form of fighter. Is 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 fi is fighter going to be ma going to be um, melee focused? Well, I mean, yet again, it's your choice. Mm -hmm. um, it's a 19th century world, so if you're going around with a with a recurve bow, your people are going to look at you funny, you know. Um, and that's the thing I always remember is like the setting. You know, it's a 19th century, and the, and the core book is going to be set in Western Europe. Um, because basing it on folklore, that's the folklore I'm familiar with. Okay, I do have plans to expand it if we are great successful Kickstarters next year or whatever. But it is a 19th century Western European Victorian period. So mm -hmm. if you are playing a fighter, you're probably going to be somebody who is maybe you're a soldier, so you would have been trained in saber, or maybe you're a pugilist or something, but you're probably going to be be, be 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 someone who does melee. You could go range if you wanted, but in a 19th century setting, range really means firearm. So it, why not just go gunslinger? You know, um, what makes the fighters really unique is 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 one of the mechanics that's in my system that's unique to well, as far as I know is unique to my system is the feat mechanic. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, which we've got a few. You've got combat feats and spell feats, and there's social feats as well. But um, essentially, a feat is a is a special move that you that you have trained in that you use in conjunction with a major action to create an additional effect so the combat feats are like signature moves that you as a warrior have trained in doing so you got things like being able to disarm somebody it could have really simple ones like ready defense so next turn you've got a plus one bonus to your defense you know mm -hmm. disarming somebody um doing extra damage all the way up to like doing ad additional attacks and you know, fainting blows and the likes, all right? Um, how the action economy in Fey Earth works is you got a major action and two minor actions per turn. The major mm -hmm. action is, like, major actions in any system. Minor actions are everything from moving to throwing something to drawing or sheathing a weapon to using feats and also reactions as well. So if you wanted to, let, let's, say I'm a, let's say I'm playing a fighter who is trained in pugilism um, and I have also taken the grapple feat well, then I'll say, all right, okay, I want to. I use my major action to punch them, and I use my. my I'm, I'm going to spend a minor action to try and grapple as well. Um, 
so that I la- oh you landed your punch how much did you roll by yet you hit the roll the target for the for the feet so not only have you punched them and done regular damage they are now grappled they are restrained and now that's brought a whole other condition into the into the scene into the fight mm-hmm. and the fighters what the fighters get is three levels of training and fighting skills so they can just get better at using their weapons but they also get three, three levels in combat feats um because this is something that I've seen this before in other systems and it really bugs me where you've got a class and there's like you are able to do this thing but then when you actually look through like level progressions you're like well the only way i get really good at this thing is if i burn all my xp resources on this thing which means i can't do anything else and this class they don't have to burn their xp resources to do their thing it's like so that's why there's the free levels of training so as a fighter you will be early on you'll start picking combat feats you're like oh this is a cool signature move that i want to have so and the idea being that like like in in tales of old heroes that they had this trick they could do with their sword or this signature move that they could do or some sort of maneuver that they would use in combat to trick or overcome their enemies and it's like so that's where the fighters come in so then and then between that uh, between the extra levels of between the free levels of training and fighting skills you can get very proficient very quickly and then the combat feats, meaning that you've got you can you're not just hitting and hitting and hitting. You're like, well, this time I want to hit them and disarm them. This time I want to hit them and grapple them. This time I just want to hurt them a lot when I hit them. So you get a lot of choice in what you're doing from turn to turn. And then the, the favorite weapons as well that you can pick, but you can change as you go up in levels. So you're doing extra damage and other cool things and like a high level, a high level fight or like epic tier, like 16, 17, 18 level, with their their favorite weapon is considered magical when fighting creatures immune to mundane weapons because it's like they have this almost magical connection to that weapon so they're fighting a specter or something that ignores swords well it doesn't ignore this sword you know so that's that's where that's what the fighter is about is this fun customization using the the feat mechanic in our system all right um well you you already mentioned a, you already mentioned a good deal about the gunslinger um yeah I'd like to I'd like to tackle because of the fa- I'd like to tackle the mystic um sorcerer and witch respectively because um given 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 how given that's given that magic is going to be a significant thing um what I'm curious about is what sort of flavor each of those brings to the fore. Well, the way the magic system in the game works is the magic is divided into spheres of magic. There's 13 spheres of magic actually funnily enough um i think there's like there's the spheres of the arcane force there's the elemental spheres earth air fire water then you got the spheres of the astral the wild life death twilight and chaos um and they all do different things okay Mm -hmm. um different professions have access to different spheres the mystic would have access to this they could learn spells from the spheres of earth air fire water um the astral life death twilight and chaos but the th- how them how spell progression works in the system is, at first level you know, two first level spells from any any two spheres of magic from the spheres that your profession has access to, and as you're going up in level you're obviously picking more spells from different spheres, but you you max out at five spheres of magic, so even though you have access to all these spheres, once you've picked your fifth sphere of magic you cannot learn spheres from spells from other spheres of magic unless it's like a free extra spell you get because of some say a, a class feature or something like that but even then it'd be like well you get this spell from this sphere but you don't get any other spells in that sphere so in that way um for all of the spell casting professions they can become quite different as i said like my my friends who had playing the two sorcerers um very different very very different characters because they pick spells from different spheres of magic so with the um, with the mystic um, profession, as I said, um, they've got a lot of they, they've access to healing spells. They've got access to um, a variety, like the the elemental um, spheres of magic. You've got a lot of offensive and defensive spells. Twilight, I describe as um, shadows, illusion, and the in between places. Mm-hmm. So this is stuff like you know control shadows, spectral double, conjuring illusion. But then at higher levels, you got things like shadow jump. Um, um, you know, where you literally you step into a shadow and jump out from another shadow, or scrying, um, or or teleportation. You know, because yet again, when you look at um, 
at, at old stories of folklore and the likes. And you even you see this a bit in Tolkien. There was the scene with Gladriel and Frodo when she like pours the water to show him the, the vision, you know, this idea that you had these these in between places as as they're commonly referred to where they, they held magic, you know. And then chaos is is like curses, hexes, that kind of stuff. So so then with the mystic, as I said, you've got first thing is well what what areas of magic are you choosing? Then is the fact that I've I've got two archetypes of mystic. You've got what we call the path of the church and the way of the ancestors. So if you're path of the church, then you're a mystic from a hierarchical institutionalized um, faith. Um, then if you are way of the ancestors, like you're we're from a much more traditional, you know, mishmash kind of not wasn't a really formal structure thing. You know, maybe there's a bit of ancestral worship there, maybe. Some low, some genus loci, or there's a, you know, it was a lot more, of a bit more of a mix, you know. So, and those archetypes straight away will give you um, uh, free spells of different types. And then you've got your vows that you would that you would pick, you know. The, I have mm-hmm. a vow of justice. So I'm trying to be help people who've been wronged. The vow of life, you know, cure the sick, you know. Um, or you can even go, I'm going to be vowed that I'm a crazy nut job. I'm trying to bring about Armageddon. I'm ending days, you know. If you want to go down that route, you can, you know. Mm-hmm. So then with, with all these different choices that you then, you will start, you, you do get a vibe for how the, um, what type of a, of a person you're going to be then, you know. Um, and, 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 in, and in what way your, your, your character is going to progress. The biggest thing with all the spellcasting classes actually is the way they have to, choose their spheres of magic more than anything like i mean by the time you've if you get to 20th level in fair earth you know something like 60 spells so it's not like it's really restrictive you know and the rules are no more than five spheres of magic and if you want to learn a spell at a new higher level you must know at least one spell at the previous level within that sphere that's it you know but it really does make you think about well, what type of a caster do I want to be? Uh, Fantasy Age had a similar thing, um, but it was a lot more restrictive. You only got, I think, two arcana. Like, um, you, 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 you know, by at high levels, you would only know six or seven spells or something from mm-hmm. two or three different f- schools of magic or whatever, you know. So, so yeah. So as I say, so the so. I, as I said, it's like, well, what kind of a mystic do you want to be? Do you want to be the healer? Do you want to be the mammy of the group? Do you want to be the the righteous zealot that is bringing justice against wrongdoers? Are you all about nature and balance? You know, what are you? You know, and so that's where, as I say, the vows combine with your archetype and then your your schools of magic, your spheres of magic ties in. Yeah. Now I'll get I'll get into I'll get into magic a bit yeah. a bit later. Um, I want I want to focus on classes for for now. Mm. I just wanted to tackle that, those as a bit of a batch. But um, lastly, the rogue is the oh. is the rogue in your setup still a bit of a skill monkey, or are or are there a few monkey wrenches thrown into your well, interpretation? Um. So the thing the thing with my rogues, rogues are are, are built similar to gunslingers <laughs> in that you've got unique rogue skills like your standard stealth sleight of hand pick locks that kind of stuff you know mm-hmm. i've got a few more like um wordsmith you know if you take that one you're like you get additional bonuses to things like persuasion and deception rolls and the likes you know and 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 yet again it, it makes for a very very um a very flavored type of, of of character you and and the rogues do get free levels of training in rogue skills as they're leveling up um Early on, actually, and it was funny because it wasn't something that I'd considered, but when I started er- early on in, in, in our home playtest, um, when um, my friend who was playing a rogue left and another friend came in, he's big into Pathfinder. And he's like, I want to play a rogue. And um, and he was like, my rogue is going to be very much about deception. They're a very charisma-based rogue. Um, Diplomancer. Uh, yeah, and, um, and really great at stealth. Like this, it was funny. Like they were incredible at like they could basically get in and out of any building without being seen because they'd really ramped up their skills for decks for stealth for for another one of the rogue skills is called cat's grace which is basically parkour all right so they had like really high levels in that and and, and the other thing in um the, that i have across the system is um everything is flat modifiers okay so if i say you have advantage it means you get a plus five bonus to your roll. It's all, I, I, like there's a few spells that will make you re-roll and take higher or lower rolls, but outside of those, 
everything is flat modifier. So if you have a skill, it's a flat modifier. So beginner level is a plus two, four, six, and then master that was a plus eight bonus to a skill. Um, but he was like, we've been playing for a bit. He's like, I'd really like it if I could be kind of an arcane trickster type person. Could we look at that? I was like, okay, okay. So I built it into the class. It was like that is, uh, when you get to, I think, the sixth level, you got a choice that you could um, you could start learning magic from the Sphere of Twilight, which is all of the illusion and shadowy based spells. Okay, mm-hmm. but then um, and we and, and so I brought that in, and, he's, and, he, and and yet again, he got some really cool spells that he used to great effect. Spells of illusion to disguise himself, spells to cloak himself in shadow to be even better at the stealth. You know, really, really good. But then when he had to leave, and my other friend Neve came back, and she was like, it was funny because she was playing a dwarf. Like a, a pure true fey dwarf, um, and um, it was the only true fey in the party, and um, and and her character was kind of like not into magic and stuff. So I said, "Well, I need to have an an alternate version." So the alternate version was, if you decided not to go down the magic route, and you, well, if you made the choice, that's it. You're stuck with the choice. But it's like if you decide not to go down the magic route, you get extra free levels of training and skills. Like you just get like free levels in any skills that you want, not just the rogue skills. So as a consequence of that, her dwarven rogue is this incredibly versatile character who is pretty damn good in combat. Um, Not as good as the party's gunslinger, but still pretty good in combat, both at range and with melee is still pretty decent and has this really diverse range of skills. You know, it's like... they're good at stealth. They're good at picking locks. They're, they're not bad at sleight of hand. They're pretty good with the hell, you know, their persuasion and deception. So I was like, yeah. Um, so I guess you could say the rogue is a skill monkey, but um, but I said because of the way I've done it, that you're you're getting a lot of choices in terms, or you get a lot of options for 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 training up in the skills, and you're not having to burn XP on skills that you would need as a rogue preventing you from then training in other things it's like well i hope it's worked i hope it's nice and balanced and gives some nice choices and flavors yeah now since i since we had te- since we had teased about it let me there let me delve in let me delve into um into the magic system that you have mm-hmm. um now for now first off First off, I would I would like to I do I do I will note that it's a nice touch that you put in rules regarding the relationship between magic and iron. Mm-hmm. Um but what but one thing one thing I'm cu- one thing I'm curious about is as I as I understand it, um the approach that you the approach that you do with with um with magic is that this is not a fire and forget system. You still have you still have to roll for your uh, spell casting. Well, yes and no. Um, so the way because we have the feat system, you have spell feats. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you take training in a spell feat, and you want the um, you want to try and get the feat to work, then you roll. Um, but the thing with the way this feat, so um, you have a target number based on the level of the spell you're casting. And then you've got your feet cost, and that's how you get your target number for with mm-hmm. the feet. So it would be major action to cast a spell, minor action to use my spell feet. Um, and in that instance, you're rolling and you add your magic score. And if you have a talent in the sphere of magic from which the spell you're casting is from, you have that modifier on top of it as well. But the thing with the spell feet system is, if I botch the roll, your spell still works. Because I have always said, if you spent the mana, the spell still works. The one thing that has always bugged me um, about... Um, systems like um, f- fifth edition. I don't know if Pathfinder has as well. We have saving throws against spells. This idea that I've I've I've, I've used a spell slot or I've spent my mana or I've I've used a resource to cast this thing and it just didn't work for some reason, you know. And it's like you never have a situation where um, the ranger shoots their longbow, the arrow goes to hit the person square in the chest, and then it misses. For some bizarre reason, you know. So it was like, so the, with the rolling for spells, it's it's only to see does the feat also work. It's like my rule is, if you burn mana, if you spend mana on a spell, it works. The only the only spell that you have to roll to attack on 
is a spell called Arcane Shard, which is the uh, which is an offensive cantrip. It's the only offensive cantrip in the system. So for that spell, you need to roll to see if you're hitting. Because this costs you no mana. You get it for free. Well, if you've learned it, you can cast it for free as your major action. So, But for everything else, it's like you're only actually rolling if you're using a spell feed. And if your opponent, they might be able to um, test to resist it, like a dex check or something like that. But um, w- with nearly every single spell, even if they pass the test, something will still happen. The only exception is that a couple of the uh, enchantment spells, charms and the likes, mm-hmm. um, some of them, if you pass the test, it doesn't work. The spell doesn't take effect because of the nature of charm magic, you know. But for everything else, it's like, no, if you've spent mana, something will happen. And if something didn't happen, you should probably run away from the thing that the magic didn't work against because they are way more powerful than you can handle right now. So it's a, it is a funny quirk of it that it lo- when you look, you're like, oh, I have to roll for this. But it's like, no, only when you're doing a spell feed. Mm-hmm. Now, give, now, given... Given that, given that, I'd also, as if I, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken if I'm not mistaken, instead of using spell slots, you're using um, mana use. Yeah, spell points basically. Mm-hmm. I just, um, I just think it's easier, and it also gives a lot more choice. And like certainly, players in any in my games who have played in other systems, as casters in other systems, have said they just they love the they feel like. They've always feel like there's more freedom in using a mana or spell point system. Um, mm-hmm. That you you've just like you, it's literally it costs this much to cast it. I have this much left in my pool. Can I cast it? Yeah. Can I spend more mana to make it more powerful? Yeah. Do I have the mana? Yeah. And there we go. And that that's um that's why I've gone with a, with that with that kind of a, a mana system. Is like I just feel like it's as a system it's simple. You know, it's like you have numbers. Do you have the same number of numbers in this pile? Yeah, well, then the spell works. And um, and I do also think it gives a bit more flexibility than slot bases. Like, slot base systems are great because they're simple. Um, mm-hmm. And, like, it's straightforward and it's clean. And if you've never played any sort of a tabletop, um, it's a, not a bad way to be introduced to spellcasters because there's a lot to keep track of when you're playing a spellcaster, you know? Um, so they're great, don't get me wrong, but I just personally have thought that I just feel that with a point-based system, you get a bit more freedom over what you're able to to do with the spells. And and certainly anybody who who's played in my game, whether in my home game, playtesting at cons or the likes, they've always said, "No, we, we really love the way you've got the system." I had they people said people have come to me said, "I really felt like I had a lot more control with what I could do with my spells than I can in other systems." Mm-hmm. Now, keep keeping that keeping that kind of thing in mind um one of the uh one of the more con- one of the more contentious rules when it came to spell casting in 5th edition in uh, in our temple was the concentration rule which mm-hmm. basically ma- basically made it that all spellcasters basically needed to have um learn ha- learn haste in order to be somewhat useful <laughs> Be- <laughs> yeah. Because of, because of how much of a um how much of an action how much of an action economy draw concentration is, mm-hmm. um. Did you end up having something sim- something similar and take that into I, account with um there, concentration with your system? There is a there is a small handful of concentration spells in my system. I think maybe half a dozen. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got a lot of spells. I have so I have. There are a small number of concentration spells in my system, and how the concentration mechanic in my system works is while you are concentrating on your spell, you cannot cast a spell with a casting time of a major action. So you can still be doing other things in a round. You still have a major... Your your spell is active, and you're concentrating on it to make sure it stays active. You can spend your major action to do other things but it can't be casting a spell of, of a major action. Now, the thing is that I think... So there's five levels of magic in my system. The first level to fifth level spells. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and I think most of the concentration... Most, if not all, the concentration spells in my game are third and fourth level spells. So they're powerful enough, meaning that by the time you get to them, you've gone up a good few levels. So you will probably have a couple of spells that you can cast as minor actions because of specializations and the likes. So it's not terribly restrictive. And also, it, the spells with concentration tend to be 
they're mostly they're spells which are usually either gonna be controlling an area um or they're an offensive spell of some type so once this spells up you're probably you're gonna be using it you know you're you're gonna be it's 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 you are going to be focusing on on this thing um it um it's not it's it, i don't none of the concentration spells in my system are anything like oh well you've cast a spell on this one person and now you have to just look at them you know and you can't do anything else like mm-hmm. you still have a bit of freedom in what you can do not as much but you you're not just stuck there you know um because of the way the action economy in my game works um you 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 can still be doing stuff even if the thing you're doing is well i'm gonna be over here and helping this person with my major action so now while i'm not casting a spell i'm helping them do a cool thing so the players well i mean so, so far none of my my players who are casters who know concentration spells have always been able to be like, oh, hey, cool, well, I can... This first-level spell, because it's my favorite sphere, I can cast it as a minor action. So here's a bonus to your defense and your defense and your defense. And and, and it's interesting because, you know, they'll go from laying down the smack in combat to controlling a situation and then going super utility and really helping everybody else. So, you know. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, one of the one of the other things I was I was curious about in this in the system um, moving past spells is the is the setup you have when it comes to I get I guess it would be your equivalent to HP in the form of grit and more mm-hmm. importantly the grit die mm-hmm. um, is the grit die your equi- your equivalent to hit die Yes, it's largely the same. But the I suppose the big difference for me with grit is. Um, you also add your resolve modifier. So when you're rolling for grit, the sorcerers are the squishiest, and the fighters and the gunslingers, they're the tough, they're the martial classes, so they're the mm-hmm. toughest, okay? They have a D10, the sorcerers a D6, and everybody else is a D8, all right? Um, but you add to it your fortitude score, if you have the hardiness talent, your modifier for that, but you also add your resolve score and the willpower talent if you have that too. Because for me, grit isn't just how much physical damage you can take, but how much... You're, you can mentally force your way through. So it's funny because, um, uh, like, my, 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 in my home game, my wife, she plays a gunslinger. We always say she's the tank of the party. One of the spellcasters actually has about the same amount of grit as her because they've got a really high resolve. Their fortitude is terrible, but they've got a really high resolve. So it's like, well, they're not physically as tough, but they have an iron will. So, therefore, they can take a lot more punishment than just somebody who's a big meat chip, you know? So, like, it's not completely different, but it's a slight difference to the flavor of it. Um, the other difference is how exhaustion works in my system. All exhaustion damage is a reduction of your max grit, basically. If you're taking exhaustion damage, then your max and current grit are now dropping. And once your max grit starts to drop, the only way you can get that back up is long rests at full health or like restoration spells and similar stuff like that. And every time your max grit drops by 25%, your fortitude and deck scores go down by one. So your defense is now going down. Your, your movement is going down. You're, you're finding it harder to resist stuff. So it's like, as I say, it's not, it's not, it's very similar to standard hit point. Because mm-hmm. and, and the reason why I didn't want to have something too different, like I did very very briefly think about what if I use a wound mechanic and then remember that wound mechanic usually equals death spiral, and I was like, no, um, they're great, but wound mechanics are terrifying. Um, so I was like, let's just keep things simple. We'll stick with numbers. And originally, it was your classic hit points, add your fortitude to the die, and then I was like. No, I want to have a bit more to it, and I was thinking about how I wanted my exhaustion mechanic to work. So then I brought in the your willpower and resolve into it. Mm-hmm. So it's as I said, it's 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 similar. If you see this, you're not going to be like, "What the hell is this?" But it's like, "Oh, that's a that's a that's a nice different feature to it there." That you know, so it's it, it does make you think about things in a slightly different way. Yeah. Now, something that I something that I do find interesting when it comes to the setting of Fey Earth, as I as I, because is the fact that you're doing, you're doing this whole notion of of the su- of the supernatural world coexisting with the with the world that we're, that everybody'd be familiar with at that time, um, but I but 
from what I'm seeing, there isn't a adversarial mundane versus magical thing, which is a bit of a ha bit of a habit that en that ends up happening with with certain writers. No disrespect yep. to no disrespect to them, but that's that's kind that's kind of become a bit that's kind of become a bit some um, easy to do. Well, yet again, I suppose I, I was coming back to yet it always comes back to the folklore, always. Mm -hmm. And when you look at European folklore, especially like in Ireland, like like people in Ireland were still using folk magic against each other in rural areas up until like the 1950s and 60s. Like that was still a thing. Like the people doing that would have been people in their 60s, 70s and 80s, of course, people who were born in the in the late 1800s. But that was still a thing. And that itself isn't unique to Ireland. And I mean, like, God, if you look at the way like Catholicism works in, a, in across Europe, it's like that's basically folk magic as well, you know. So I was like, and I was, I was thinking like, well, when we, when you actually look at people's beliefs, up until the mid to late eighteen, up until the mid eighteen hundreds, certainly, some would argue even the late eighteen hundreds, in a lot of places, everybody thought fairies were real. They were just a thing that people accepted and believed. People thought witches in the evil eye was a thing that you could curse somebody. In Ireland, it's called a pishog, you know, and uh, and uh, somebody who could cast a, those things were called a pishogi. Like, so people would do these things, you know? Why? is like, well, and it wasn't, and it was considered a thing, like, you, why would you Why would you curse your neighbors? Like, well, I want my farm to do better. I want my cows to produce more milk, so my family's not as more prosperous. And it wasn't even necessarily, and I, I hate that person, and, they're, and I want to harm them, it was, I want to screw them over so I can do better, you know? And it was like, this was a very normal thing, these ideas of brownies and hobgoblins and bogarts and, and you know, you know, um, charms that you would like put on a ba over a baby's cradle so that the fairies wouldn't take them and the likes. And, and so then I'm thinking, well, what if the fairies are real and bogarts are real and magic is real and all these beliefs always existed anyway of how people lived in this, magical world that they believed in the only change is the magic is now legitimately real you know so that was why i never felt that there would be have to be the need for this conflict between the mundane and the magical like the conflict in between the mundane and the magical is one of the true fae are absolutely ridiculously powerful creatures and you do not want to annoy them you treat them with respect if you have to deal with them you always treat them fairly and if you treat them with respect, you will be okay. But that, but you know, it's like that's it, you know. But but that it was like, well, if I think of all the stories I'd hear of, you know, for, um, farmers' wives and grandmothers in different parts of Europe and the folk magics that they had that they would have practiced, um, and if that was in a world where no, these fairies are actually real, then that magic now becomes real. So it's it's an everyday magic, you know. It's it's. And that's where you've got this you've got this weird dichotomy of growing age of industrialization, but magic and magitech and folk magic is still a thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's rare. Like you've got people will do charms and stuff, like they'll have their bit of iron that they hang over the cradle so the fairies won't take their child. Um, because they know that fairies don't like iron. But and then you'll have the village healer who actually knows a couple of spells and can make some healing tinctures maybe and a few little amulets and the likes because she's a bit of a witch, mm -hmm. you know, and she's got some magic. But everyone's like, well, yeah, if you've got a problem, you go to the old woman who lives on the side of the, the hill over there and she'll help you out. I was like, Because that was what people thought. That was the norm in so much of Europe for so long. It was like, well, n now the magic is real. That's not going to change. It's just further, you know solidified it's validated in a way so that was why i didn't have ever this need to think of well surely there'll be a conflict between the mundane and the magical i have a friend of mine who's french and we're talking about it over coffee or something i can't remember and i was like you know i was looking for his name but well, how do you think it'd be different and he's like well you know during the enlightenment era there was like a real like trying to get rid of all of these ridiculous superstitions of the peasant farmers and the fairies and all the rest of them let them realize, you know, we believe in science, this is all nonsense. And they're thinking, yeah, but in Fair Earth, it's actually not nonsense because they're actual fairies. So, you know, you can be some bourgeois 
educated man from Paris, but if you start saying that in this area and the fairies hear you, you're going to be in for a world of pain, mate, you know? So it was like, yeah, there, there's never going to be a conflict here. You have to learn to live alongside each other, otherwise you're going to have problems. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I can, and the end, um, I can certainly, I can certainly see that, and I will, I do have to ask, I do have to ask this, un, this unfortunate question, um, given, given the fact that you do have this intersecting of, ma of magic and, te and tech, um, has, and has, when, you, when doing playtesting, has anyone brought up Shadowrun to you? Um, no, actually. I think because it's because it's 19th century, I think that's why no. A few uh, people made references to Carnival Row. You remember there was the uh, mm -hmm. the TV series that came out with Orlando Bloom and Carla Devine. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I'm not gonna lie. When that came out, I was like, my biggest fear when I started working on Fair Earth was that I'll spend four or five years working on this, and somebody else will beat me to it and produce something, and I'll be like, and that, and then when I, when Carnival Row came, I was like, it's happened. It's happened. Somebody's beat me to it. But then I sat down and I watched it and I loved it. It was a really great series. My wife and I thought it was absolutely brilliant. It was like, oh, this is grand. This is actually, they, I know they're saying it's Faye living alongside humans, but it's completely different to my setting. Like, because it's like, there's, it's all make believe. It's a, it's a, it's a make believe world. They've got human sized, human sized fairies with wings. It's like, you know, completely different. It was like, you know, but so that, but I think with the Shadowrun thing, one or two people were like, oh, that kind of reminds me of Shadowrun. But they would straight away say, oh, wait, it's 19th century, so no. you know. And as far as Shadowrun is, I've never played Shadowrun. I read one of the books, the book, and it was really good. Everybody says the books are great, and the system is very divisive. You either love it or you loathe it. But um, my wife did play it, and she hated it. Um, But it was like, it, but I think it was because of the time period, it was like nobody has made that connection. She's... I get the feeling. I get the feeling your wife would probably get along more with um, Shadowrun Anarchy, which is significantly more streamlined. She there was all I know is she talked about one time when they were playing, and one of the players was some sort of a a, ha a techno hacker. I don't know. He spent an hour and a half rolling to try to hack one of the other guy's guns, failed the roll, and his character was incapacitated, throwing up for the next thirty forty minutes, and then the rest of the players. Got like it was a half an hour in real time, an hour and a half in real time, rolling on tables to hack the gun, and then when he failed, they got on with the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can I can understand that that kind of, that kind of thing does ha does happen. Um, but when but when it comes now when it comes to, when it comes to this partic with this particular um this particular setting because of, I think one of the key I think one of the key things that need that needs to be established and th that's why I'm also glad that you put up a um pr a primer is what are what are some of the thing what are some of the things that um people would ha people would have to unlearn I get I guess is the word I guess is the word I'd use regarding how a lot how a lot of people have a lot of people's idea of Faye in system versus the way Fey are the way Fey are portrayed in Fey Earth. The biggest thing you'd have to unlearn is all of the stuff that people think of when they hear names like Cobalt, Hobgoblin, Brownie, Dwarf. Like basically what happened as far as I can tell, what happened was in the 70s when Gygax was making D&D, &D, he cracked open a bunch of books on European folklore or fairy tales and took the, all these cool-sounding names of creatures and then used the names. But the creatures are nothing at all like what the folklore was. I mean, cobalt is a word used in German-speaking regions for basically a brownie, mm -hmm. a short... Or what I call in my system the domestic fae. So a short fae creature that would live in homes and help around with chores and things like that. Um, they're not tiny little dumb dog or dragon type people. They were actually the thing with the with the thing with kobolds was you never saw them because they were always invisible. If you got to see one, then um, they would be usually depicted as like a short, squat, kind of ugly looking, very old man. There was one story, I think it was from Dusseldorf, I'm not sure, 
of a kobold that lived in like some noble's palace and one of the servants tricked him into revealing himself and br dropping his invisibility and when he did he became so enraged he ripped the servant's arm off beat him to death and then left the palace and never returned mm -hmm. that's what a kobold is you know um a hobgoblin is what you call a brownie if you live in the north of england if you live in places like yorkshire you know that's the big difference really in my system is that we have heard these like even goblin like a goblin when you think of Goblin, you think of Lord of the Rings. You think of a green-skinned, cave-dwelling guy who likes to eat man flesh. That's not what Goblins were. They were usually depicted as really tiny, old-looking men with long, snowy white beards, often maybe a conical hat and all the rest of that stuff, or very young-looking human figures, you know? And they weren't inherently evil. They were assholes sometimes. They were, they were pranksters. They were mischievous, really powerful magically. But they weren't going around talking about, you know, eating man flesh. And so that's going to be the big thing for people is they're going to see all these magical creatures and they're like, oh, cool. And then they're like, this isn't, you know, this isn't what I think of when I think of this creature. Um, because I've been going back to the original source material. Like one of the first books that I that I actually and it's the it's a PDF copy of my oldest source material. And it's a book that was originally published in 1691. Um, and it's the the Commonwealth of what's well, the Commonwealth of Elves, Fauns, and Fairies by uh, Robert Kirk, who was a Scottish minister in in the alive in the late um, the late seventeenth century. Like so, mm -hmm. that's that's how old I've been going. As I said um, before, we started like a lot of the a lot of my um, reference material is like academic papers, PDFs by like academic folklorists, you know. So, like, really, really, really going back, you know. Um, and that's where the big difference is, is going to be. That and also people underestimating just how powerful um, these creatures are. In fact, that was a big struggle I had early on in the game, um, was how do I make a system whereby the creatures in it are an accurate and fair depiction of what they were in folklore without TPKing an entire party. So what I ended up doing was, for the fake creatures, they come in three stat blocks, young adult and ancient and um so that i can like have varying degrees of power because if you were having every fairy have all the abilities that fairies are said to have in the original stories a single fairy could tpk a party of seventh level or lower on their own easily and a tenth level party might beat them but they'd have a tough time mm -hmm. you know so it's like so how do i how do I create a system where my players can be having fun and facing, not necessarily battling, a lot of the time it's negotiation, but facing these magical creatures without fear of death? So that's why I brought in the young adult and ancient staff block. So the young, a young fae creature has some of the abilities that we see in stories. And then the adult has a bit more. And then the ancient is like, they're the, they're, they're the really, really powerful ones. So that's, that will be the big thing is, as I said, will be, um, will be that. And then also there's a few other quirky little assumptions. So uh, you mentioned iron and I am um, so iron and its effects on magic from spellcasters. You know, if, um, if you can't, the classic, if you're a spellcaster, you can't wear metal armor unless it's fancy magic metal armor, you know, mm -hmm. cause you know, why not? It's a classic. If it's not broke, don't fix it. But, um, and the armor, the way armor works in my game, um, armor doesn't make you harder to hit. Armor makes you harder to hurt. I know the age system uses it. Loads of systems use this. Mm -hmm. So when you get hit, you subtract your armor from the damage roll. And in my game, all armor has two ratings. A larger number, which will be um, your resistance to damage from a melee attack or from a non-firearms-based projectile. And then the smaller number is your resistance to firearms projectiles and magic so when you get into the metal armor that's when you start seeing a value greater than zero for the second number but when you get to the fey you know we talk about oh fairies are vulnerable to iron fairies are vulnerable to iron in the folklore that we see in ireland and scotland mm -hmm. north of england wales france germany italy spain sweden no, like literally any other country I've, I've studied where they talk about fairies, there's almost ne there. You do occasionally see it pop up occasionally, but uh, very seldom, you know, that you will have this. 
um iron vulnerability so so that's another thing in, in the game is that you know not all fake creatures are vulnerable to iron and even within like if you have your players facing say a brownie which is what they were the domestic fairies are called in scotland brownies are vulnerable to iron but you go a couple of kilometers south you're into yorkshire you're into north cumbria they're now called hobs or hobgoblins. They they weren't vulnerable to iron. You go over to France, same thing again. They weren't vulnerable to iron. So that's the other thing is like, well, the, 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 it it all comes back to a set assumptions of oh, I know what this thing is because I've heard this name before. It's like, you know what they what way they are depicted in popular culture now, mm-hmm. but the way they're depicted in popular culture now is not the way they were depicted. It's not what people thought of a hundred and fifty years ago when they were telling these stories around the around the the, the the living room fireplace every night you know when people actually still believed these things were real this not this is not what they were describing so that's that's going to be the big thing i'll people that's why there's no orcs in my game orcs were created by tolkien they do not exist in folklore at all so there are no orcs in fey earth because they were an invention by him yeah now I was I was I was racking my brain earlier trying to trying to trying to figure out the other game that I was reminded of, even though this is a significant stretch, and that particular game um, was eighteen seventy nine. Um, oh, I've heard of that one. Mm-hmm. I've never played it. I've no idea what it's about, but I have heard of eighteen seventy nine. Is that <laughs> is that not a war game? Mm, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> um, there is a there is a wargaming sister project to 1879 because it, okay. it, it is it is one of the two lines that um fa- that FASA focuses on these days, um. But the it's uh, 1879 is kind of is meant to be the is meant to be on one form the um the steam the tech punkish um sequel to Earth Dawn. In both cases, doing the whole ma- magic, it magic ebbs and flows in the same way that in the old days when they ha- when they're under the same banner, um, Earth Dawn was a prequel to Shadowrun. In that in that regard, um, it's just it's just that um, eighteen seventy nine is go- is ob- obviously you're dealing with a, you're dealing with a century ahead, but it is. It is go it is going a little bit more with the intro with the introduction of Steam Tech, um, and ha- and how that affects everything, but when it comes now when it comes to when it comes to Fey Earths um Fey, the other the other thing that the other thing that I'm curious about that I'm curious about is in is in regard to, you mentioned magic being ra- being rare but is it is it so? Is it so rare that um, that ma- that mages would be looked at sideways, or an- anyone who utilizes magic, or are people using folk magic enough anyways so that it's it's not as much of a stretch? So it's kind of a it's kind of a, a two sided thing in that folk magic is common enough, but also magitech is common. Like, um, so you know, if you're a, a seamstress, you will go into an artificer's and get some enchanted sewing needles to help you do your job, you know? Mm-hmm. You will buy a goblin spark to light your pipe up. It's a magical zippo, you know? Um, like, one thing, people always ask me, uh, you know, like, your random Twitter questions, what's one random difference that your setting has that has nothing to do with, like, the core mechanics? In Fey Earth, whales are way more common. The oceans are teeming with whales, because the cities of Europe light their streets with fairy globes. So they didn't have to go hunting whales for their oil. You know, it's like this random thing. I was like, remember when they were saying, actually, wait, no. I, I, can't remember. I was watching some movie and it was about whalers and stuff. And then I realized, and, and I was like, wait a minute. We, we, we're using fairy globes in the city. So they don't actually need to, they don't need whale oil. So they're not going to be hunting the whales. So there's like way more whales in Fey Earth because... They're not hunting them on anywhere near the same scale. So, so as I said, it's kind of a it's a weird one in that. Yeah, if you have magic, like little bits of folk magic are common, but like proper like sorcerers, mystics, proper levels of power, that is super rare. So it's kind of like more of an awe thing, you know. Um, it's you're not going to be looked on fearfully 
necessarily because well there's fairies and elves and stuff as well and they're even more powerful again you'll be looked on as kind of really kind of powerfully unique like in this in the world the way i've kind of looked at it was that well, I mean, because it's because of the time period it's set in, people aren't going off and adventuring and fighting dragons and getting treasure and being heroes. It's, mm-hmm. it's the 1873, you know, people have jobs, you know, what kind of jobs would you have if you're a sorcerer? Well, you're probably going to be working in Magitech. You're probably going to be working either in a local artificers, making everyday items that people give you money for to make their lives easier, you know. Or you're going to be working with industrialists making larger kind of Magitech machinery that's going into factories, you know? Mm -hmm. But you're still pretty damn... You are, like, a very important position in the world. Um, Likewise with the mystics. is like, um, not every... um, Like, mystics are technically all clerics or priests, but not every priest is a mystic, you know? Mm -hmm. You can be a priest in the Christian church, but that doesn't mean you can use magic. You know, that doesn't mean you have the ability to cast spells. You don't have that gift, but you still were a priest, you know. Um, So when you do come across a mystic, they tend to be viewed as, well, this person's like highly regarded and really special. You know, they've got these healing gifts that are super rare, you know, Mm -hmm. and and, and the the like. So it's kind of, um, yeah, it's like it's more of like people might look on you sideways a bit, but they're more likely going to be like, that person's really cool and powerful and we should probably like just treat them with respect and maybe get on their good side because maybe they'd be a useful person to know, you know? Um, because I suppose the other thing with the system is um, it's not something that I've deliberately hard coded into it, but I am constantly thinking of there's, there's the, like the 1900s was even more so than today, a horribly classist society, you know, um, mm-hmm. like workers rights and all the rest of that, you know, um, as bad as they are now, back then it was horrific, you know. So if you're like, actually, I remember like what my, my my player who's playing the mystic, um, she decided um she needed some coins, so she put up an ad in the papers as like healing abilities. So I was like, I started having like rich people coming to her to try and like the first thing was like too young for this who'd um they'd lost limbs in war, so she grew them back, and but they were from wealthy families, and then I had some a guy who had been injured in a factory and he's like coming up to her cap in hand i'm really sorry and she's like no i'll do this you're for free and then there was the guy who'd gotten syphilis which he cured and then told them you better bring your wife next tomorrow or i'm coming after you and cured the wife and charged him triple what she charged the rest you know and he was just like great (laughs) this is awesome she's like this doesn't mean you can go get it again you filthy you know, so um, it's this kind of, yeah, the weird quirks of like, it's still the late 1800s, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so a lot, like, I even thought, like, within the system, you've got your, the two main um, lineages in the system are just a, 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 a straightforward human or fey touch, which is a human with some fey blood in them. One of their ancestors was fey, and that is carried on. And the fey, fey touch are all, you, you start the game with a, with a one in magic. And as long as if you have a magic of one or higher, you, in, you can use spells. You can cast magic. So I was like, the Fey Touch, though, like they all have innate abilities. They can all know. They'll know one or two cantrips, but most of them are just too busy working, providing for themselves and their families. You know, mm-hmm. they still have to eat. They still have to, you know. So they're not wasting their time on magic and stuff. It's like, yeah, they'll use their magic to help them in their day to day lives where they can. But they're more worried about paying their way, getting their wages, surviving. That like, it's really only those rare few exceptions who are really skilled. And then once you get into the rarities, it's like in any game, adve- the whole idea of adventures is they are special, they are different, they are that more skilled. So people will look on them, people will ask them for help where they can, um, mm-hmm. or rich assholes will try to exploit them. You know, in that way, it's no different to any other game. Now, would it be fair that bring that brings a que- that brings a question of. Um... Of story of story styles that can be done that can be done in this game, um, would it be fair of me to say that all, that a fair amount of the setting lends itself more to to or to urban fantasy? Yeah, it definitely. Um, um, <clears throat> certainly, the way I've been playing it, it has, and I I wasn't it wasn't a deliberate choice, but it is at low levels. It's gonna you're gonna be looking at more urban fantasy. 
which brings a lot of fun into it as well because you know you've got your fey touch communities you've got your true fey artificers your goblins and dwarves usually because in the world of fey earth as i've explained in the lore primer once the industrial age kicked in most of the other fey that were living in human cities were like there's too much steel there's too much smoke there's too much dirt and they moved out um, so it is like uh, at lower levels, you're looking at more urban fantasy at higher levels. You, you not necessarily. So now I'm not saying you have to be, you know, urban fantasy. It's just more of a thing of like, yeah, you could be going out to fairy mounds and sites and all the rest of that stuff at level one, level two. Um, one thing I actually had to do in the game, um, I had to create a couple of magical creatures, um, so one example is um, a, what I call a rock gnome. It's like a tiny little elemental type thing, and they live in subterranean areas. And tree gnomes, a like Groot, basically. All right, well, mini like baby Groot. Okay, and I create. I had to create a couple of magical creatures like this, and it was literally so that I had some stuff that yet again you can have your players facing at low levels. Going back to what I was saying, it's not going to TPK them, you know. So the, the I have like two or three creatures in the system in the setting that are not they're my own creations they're not from folklore at all um but it was simply so that you as a gm can have your players in a in a is in a situation where they're able to do some stuff and be adventuring and they're not in a town they're not in a city they can be outside but a lot of the stories that i've that i've had have been mostly ur urban um if you not like you've still you've still got your like like we got ghosts and stuff in the game too as well so you know um i know a, a one shot that i did um at an irish con where you were basically you'd been hired by some some guys who like to they they, they hire people to get um, ex expensive ant antiquities that they will then auction off to mm -hmm. rich people with more money than cents and they were sent to uh, an abbey which had mysteriously burnt down and um, they were looking for a book. And it turned out that the Abbey were a, they were a, a heretical Christian cult who had been worshiping a dark fey entity, you know? So in that one, there was like, yeah, it was an, it was a ruins of an Abbey. There were fighting specters. It was a lot of fun, you know? So you do get that, but, but a lot of it, a lot of it so far I have has, has been a fantasy. And that's, that's where I have had the more so is, um, is when people make the Shadowrun references or the Carnival Row references mm -hmm. because it's a lot of it is in towns and in cities and the likes. Now, I'm working on other stuff. Um, um, certainly, uh, like in, in, the, in, in the setting um, where the, uh, France is, has these elven palaces across the country that were abandoned by the elven nobles during the French Revolution mm -hmm. um, because the mob decided... We're getting rid of all the nobles. So the elven nobles, um, they ended up getting out of town as well because it was like, yeah, we're really powerful, but they don't care, and they're a crazed mob, and we're killing them, and they're still coming for us. Oh, crap, we have to get out of here, you know? Um, so you do have, depending on where you set the game, you, have, you do have plenty of opportunities where you don't have to be in an urban setting. Mm -hmm. But then if you are in the urban setting, you do have a lot of fun with bits of magic coming into it, and then and all the rest of that as well yeah now are i think you you had hit you had hinted earlier on that you were going to be putting um fey earth on kick on kickstarter down the down the road um mm -hmm. do you have a do you have a launch do you have a launch time for that and what are, what are you planning down the road when it comes to expanding <sighs> fey earth so provisionally the plan now is next year hopefully next summer mm-hmm launch the kickstarter um uh, like the, the actual system itself is 85 percent written so far um the kickstarter would be mostly would be to fund artists um mostly um i'd say ha at least half the money if i raise my kickstarter would be to pay artists and then the rest will be looking at printing um paying somebody a professional editor to edit and typeset and lay out my work because God, that is hard to do. If you have not trained in it, it's so hard to learn on your own. Um, but um, so that's where that would be for. But um, um, the dream is for the summer. Um, certainly before before the end of next year, I would I want to have launched a Kickstarter. Um, 
there's a few factors that have really got me nervous about it and make me wanting to push it out a bit but it's like no you have to just do it and it's like it's nothing to do with writing it's to do with covid um it's like shipping and distribution costs have quadrupled across the planet you know um if you are producing a book that you are going to be shipping out that is now a problem um so many ttrpg creators are saying that they're being hit by these costs that they never saw coming uh, and not because they didn't budget but because covid has just really messed things up mm -hmm. so that is that's a very real concern um there's a lot of people coming online keyboard warriors criticizing kickstarters that are you know saying these are ridiculously high target numbers you know why do you need to raise this much money for a kickstarter or having done it being hit with these shipping costs and this is outrageous and it's like it's covid it's a pandemic it's a once in a century pandemic you know um that's the problem so that kind of stuff has me like oh maybe not but the dream is by the end of next year um is to have launched a kickstarter um with the view to within 12 months of that people will have a physical copy of the book in their hands Mm -hmm. after that is done as i said this the, the the core rule book and when and when i uh the, the and the the what i would hope well it'll have to see how it works logistically but i would like to include some sort of a starter adventure pack in the core rule book as well for the kickstarter i'm like i have a starter pack currently on my itch.io page and with that starter pack it's like 25 dollars, but you get nearly 300 pages worth of a pdf which is a early release core rule book mm -hmm. um a a GM's guide and a starter adventure module for players from levels one to five. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like literally everything you need to start, you get there for twenty five dollars. And then I have the lore primer, which is free download, just to give you a bit of extra context. But you know, I would love to have with a Kickstarter. Like, yeah, it's not just a book, but maybe there's an adventure in there as well that can get you going. Um, but then, as I said, like the core rulebook is set in Western Europe, and the reasons for that quite simply because first of all this was very much an academic labor of love i was trying to be as faithful to the original folklore as i can in my setting so i'm not just writing up stories i'm not just um like creating a, what i think are codes like no 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 what were people saying and like so many of the books that i have are reprints of books that were written um 130 140 150 years ago you know mm -hmm. um one of the like i remember like one of the more modern like unless it's like a modern folklorist you know has um like a, a very modern folklorist who's alive right now it's all books that were like uh, 1918 or older you know so because of that it was like well i'm not a folklorist as i said i teach maths and science to kids mm -hmm. all right I have a lot of familiarity with folklore through my own upbringing, my own passions and interests, and my own culture coming from Ireland. We have a very rich folklore, but I'm not a folklorist, and I don't have the time to study folklore of a whole bunch of different countries. So it's like stick a stick with what I know, which is in order of familiarity: Irish folklore, then then Scottish and British, and then Nordic, and then European. Mm -hmm. Um. So that was the first thing. It was like, I, I don't have the time to be... Like, I remember uh, at one of the Irish cons, there was a lovely girl in the game. She had so much fun. And she's... Um, she was Where is it she was from? Um, she wasn't Polish. She was um, Moldovan, I think she was. And she's like, oh, are you going to have any Slavic stuff? And I was like, no. And she's like, but it's like, Slavics have some of the richest and most detailed folklore on all of Europe. I don't have the time to learn Slavic folklore. It's like, Slavic folklore is incredible. I don't have the time to learn that, you know? So it's like, so it's definitely set in Western Europe. The, the dream would be, we launched a Kickstarter. It's an amazing success. We sell our books. We, 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 and we get enough money from the sale of the books to having paid all of the artists and all the rest of that, of course, to then have startup capital for the expansion pack. The expansion pack would be an African expansion pack, mm -hmm. um, on which we're all already working on. A good friend of mine who she's originally from Zimbabwe. She's been living in Ireland since she was younger She's already been, and she's a player in my game, um, in my current game. 
playing this wonderful sorcerer who's from Zimbabwe and traveled to Europe. It's like, I want to learn about all these crazy fairies in Europe and what all these white people are doing. I was like, is it? So the plan would be an African expansion and then maybe a North American expansion. But for those expansions, they will only happen, first of all, if the original Kickstarter is successful. And secondly, if I can get people from those parts of the world and from those cultures who would be interested in working on this. I'm a really, really white Irish guy. I am not going to be going around and writing about other cultures, you know, not going to happen at all. Um, but I've been putting out feeders to people, you know, like I've, as I said, my, my, my dear friend who is originally from Zimbabwe and she's talking to all of her family back home in Zim and other friends of hers from other African countries talking to um, they, um, uh, indigenous um, uh, Native American First Nations uh, peoples as well. Really interested in stuff. So this would the idea would be slowly expanding it out, starting with Africa, then maybe North America, then maybe Eastern and Central Europe or South America. And it, it all comes down to finding people who would be interested in working on this together. Like for something like an African expansion, I'd be working on it, but I'd be the guy at the back end. like, well, the mechanics, let's, this is awesome. Now let's get it to fit in the mechanics kind of thing. Not in any way saying, well, can we change this? It was like, no, if that's what the culture said. If that's what the story said, this is going into it. Now, how do I get this to fit in my system with my mechanics in a way that still faithfully depicts what the folklore said. Mm -hmm. And I'll be I'll be keeping a close eye <clears throat> on how that on how that develops. Mm. But I mean the, the the big goal right now is my big big push right now is we've got a bit of a things are getting pretty serious at the moment in my current game. Um, one of the players might be dying, and it's my wife's character, so I'm really hoping that doesn't happen. But epic champions battle between an elven warrior prince inspired by Prince Nawada from Hellboy 2. I love that movie so much. Mm -hmm. um, and um, But um, after that current arc is finished, we're planning on starting to record our games and um, launch them, uh, release them as an audio podcast. That's I'm hoping, and hoping by the end of September we'll have that out. Um, because... The one thing I've learned, if you want to have a successful Kickstarter, is you need to have a people interested in it first. So trying to build up that kind of a fan interest in a community is so hard, is so crucial. So the, the, the in the in the short term, we're hoping to have a podcast out soon. Um, um, so keep an eye out. Definitely, I'll be all over my Twitter account once we get that launched, so people can actually know well, what the setting is like. And a few people who have been contact me about playtesting you're saying we want to actually record this as podcast so that's going to be cool as well but yeah all working towards the a successful kickstarter next year mm -hmm. and let, and with that with that in mind i would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness that happens around here no it's been great i love talking about my game so like i'm never going to turn out an opportunity to do that and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, I'll be. I have some very, very nice um, whiskey that I'm gonna be um, having a glass of after this. It's actually called uh, Selkie whiskey, funnily enough. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's made of seal. It's uh, it's got a nice, nice peaty um, aftertaste to it. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>